All right. That's great. Thank you, everyone. So good afternoon uh, and welcome to DevOps Day. Uh, my name is Josue and I'm a technical coach here at Makers Academy. Uh, so today, uh, one of our DevOps cohorts at Makers uh, graduated. So they finished the DevOps specialization today uh, on the apprenticeship uh, course on DevOps with us. So around eight weeks ago, um, the DevOps September 21 cohort uh, that I'm going to present today started the DevOps journey at Makers, and what a journey it's been, I would say. Um, Simo, who's also a technical coach, uh, and unfortunately could not make it today to be here with us, uh, and myself have been their coaches for the last eight weeks of the of the course at Makers. Um, as part of the, the DevOps course, we both have been their coaches, are, are really happy with the progress that they've made, and really proud to see what all of the uh, knowledge and the skills that they built since day one on DevOps. Um, they've worked as a very quick and high level summary. They've worked with different DevOps tools and AWS services. AWS has been the main and designated cloud provider for the duration of the whole DevOps course for the last eight weeks. And I would say, um, more importantly, I think they got a great overview now of DevOps and how it fits in the software development lifecycle. And the first weeks of the DevOps course were designed to give the students our foundations of containers, serverless, and mainly CI and CD as well. That that's something that they've built on uh, for the duration of the, the rest of the weeks of the modules of the DevOps course. And then the following weeks after the, the initial weeks, built on some of these concepts and introduced also new ones, such as infrastructure as code using Terraform. And the students could then utilize all of this knowledge that they gain for more complex uh, projects later on in the course. Um, about Talking about complex projects, over the last two weeks of the course, students have split in three teams and worked uh, towards improving the reliability of, a, of an existing production system uh, that was created and given to them. They were thrown into the deep end of a uh, production system that was not very reliable and with a major caveat. So they were not able to access pretty much anything about the existing production system, except from the load balancer that was created for them. They will give you more information about it very soon. Um, so now the students are going to uh, run through their presentations uh, in three groups. And after that, we're going to have a QA. and uh, where you get the chance from the audience to ask any questions uh, for them that you may have, although you may be thinking of, about the, their journeys, uh, makers, their presentations, what they've been up to, what they learn, what they like the most, what they like the least, every, anything that is on your mind. Um, and so without further ado now, let's begin with the presentations. Uh, the first team presenting uh, today will be Team Two Stars. Uh, team Two Stars will, send first, as I say, they worked toward, uh, toward the, the uh, completion of this reliability project over the last two weeks as a team of five members to tackle that challenge. So we get to hear more about their journeys in a second. Uh, so please, Tim, would you like to go ahead? All right, hi, uh, thanks for coming to our presentation. We're team one, or the team formerly known as Stars in the Rise. In this presentation, we will outline the project, problems we came across and how we tackled them, technologies we used, and any future work we'd like to investigate given a bit more time of the project. We will also be taking any more, uh, any questions that you have at the end. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what was the project about? We were contacted by HOSP, uh, an organization which provides software services to veterinary hospitals carrying out tasks such as database CRUD operations, patient documents and analysis of medical images. Our main task was to provide reliability improvements to their server. We defined reliability, uh, well sorry, reliability is, was defined as request receiving a valid response within three seconds. Uh, a successful improvement to this reliability was a target of hitting this with 99.99% of the requests while maintaining service uptime of 99.999. We were successful in hitting this goal. Uh, we were presented with several limitations across the project. The main issue was a lack of communication between the host maintainers and the DevOps team. This made understanding and investigating issues very difficult and the finding their causes a bit very difficult. The second was only having access to the load balancer, and not to the server files or the server configuration. Uh, these limitations meant that we had to come up with some creative solutions to identify and improve the existing systems. We proceeded through this task using a strangler fig pattern, incrementally migrating and updating legacy systems while maintaining server uptime, basically minimizing downtime while improvements were implemented. Okay, 
our working methodology. Each day we'd start with a 20 minute morning check-in. We chatted about previous days work, cleared up any confusion anyone might have, uh, make sure everyone was up to speed, etc. We did an emotional check-in, make sure no one was too frustrated, no one felt like super far behind or anything. Helped us get each day off to the, on uh, the best foot forwards. We also signed different facilitators each day, given the whole group and uh, given the whole group the opportunity to lead the team, to practice the leadership style, to you know practice. Uh, while working, we split our time between mobbing, with all five of us being present when decisions, changes, and stuff were implemented, and individual research time, where we split up, did individual work, read up on a new topic or a new uh, or investigate something we were confused about. We then put all that information onto a Miro board, which we built with diagrams, notes, links. It was really, really good resource to have at all times. Uh, we did 40 minutes off, 10 minutes off, we, which was effective because it stopped us all getting frustrated and burned out. But I personally think the thing that helped us most was the fact that we were really supportive. We helped each other when someone was stuck. We stopped everything. We made sure that person was caught back up. You know, it helped us all feel like we were contributing, which was really nice. Cool. Hello. Uh, right. So initially, um, the first thing that we, we knew that we would have to do was to gain visibility on why reliability wasn't 100%. Uh, to do this, we enabled logging in the EC2 instance of the HOSP server. Um, and Michael provided us with this lovely little Python script, which enabled us to get even, well, it was like an easier, easier way of reading the logs. Um, and we were also able to sort through them to find all of the 500 responses. Uh, and we noticed that there were only get and post requests. So we knew that those were the ones that we need to focus on. Um, we also had the hard job of not being able to access the host server because we did have um, documentation to tell us what that 500 error meant. And it was a server side error, but we obviously didn't have access to those. So that was kind of the first port of uh, thinking of what we might have to do next. Um, so we decided that we would implement a proxy server, which would mean that we could write a little script and basically send only positive 200 or 201 responses back to the load balancer. So to do this, hello, our, we had an initial plan. Um, so we just diagrammed it really quickly uh, which you can see on the slide there. So we had the traffic generator go to the load balancer, load balancer the proxy, proxy to the HOSP EC2. Um, and we had hoped, we would hope that our proxy code was able to only send back 200 or 201 responses. We used a number of different um, technologies for this, uh, but we kind of chose those based off our experience over the past six weeks. Because we, we decided that because this was our last and final project that we wanted to get the most out of this. So we decided to consolidate as much as we could possibly do um, from the past six weeks. So we did use quite a few different uh, technologies there, as you can see. Um, so what we decided to do was to have two repos, uh, one for infrastructure and one for deploying. So we used Terraform to uh, to create all the infrastructure, we used um, Elastic Beanstalk to actually deploy our app uh, and we containerized our app and we pushed it to the Elastic Container Registry as well. So we did do quite a lot of um, infrastructure work there, but as I said, it was because we wanted to get the most out of consolidating our, our learning from the past two weeks. We did realise quite quickly that it was going to be more of a challenge than what we initially thought um, but I still have no regrets <laughs> uh, because I feel like we learned a lot out of picking all of these technologies. So Daniel is going to talk you through some of the issues we had because <laughs> it was not smooth sailing. Hi so yeah just with any project there's always a multitude of problems and we definitely had our fair share. So our first major one was when we were trying to deploy our proxy app we originally couldn't get our push and deploy jobs to pass, and even once they did, our Elastic Beanstalk application, it would update with a new image. So what we did was we went through our old work and diagrams to try and get a better understanding of what was happening like, behind the scenes. And we, and we realized that we needed a S3 bucket and a Docker run. And so once we had got that working, we then wanted to redirect our load balancer to 
to our new EC2 instance. But every, every time we try to do so, we just watched our reliability go down and down. So we did some research, tried a few different ways. And the final way was editing the security group of our EC2 instance, which allowed our Elastic Beanstalk cut to access it. And yeah, that worked. So then we were getting an error, and it validates on response body error, which was whenever our proxy would try and send back the host response to the load bouncer, it wasn't able to access the data. So we used our Stack Overflow board, which is quite helpful, and we realized that another team had come across the same error. And then we realized that we needed our proxy to send back a JSON response body. So what we did was we just made some changes to our proxy code and added a few headers, got it working. So as you can see from that, we've obviously had a very productive and positive week, even with all of those problems. Um, and it's really let us use our skills that we've learned over the past few weeks in troubleshooting as well. Um, and we finally come out with the outcome of a 100% reliable system that when it gets a request from the traffic generator, it sends it to our proxy instead, which then won't let any other passing requests through. So all failures get completely eliminated. And we had an event happen uh, with Crufts next door which meant that there was an increase uh, in traffic on the server and ours still manages to keep up with that, even with there being a lot more requests than there were before. I think it increased by about 600 or something ridiculous. Um, and it still held strong and worked fast and we didn't have any that timed out. Um, but overall, this final project has really compiled everything from previous weeks that we've learned about and studied um, into one whole continuous uh, grind through the past two weeks and everyone's put their own little bit in and um, I think we've done really well and I'm really happy and everyone else is with what we've achieved. Okay, so um, outside of these two weeks, we had some ideas of how we would continue with the project. Um, first and foremost, we would probably go back over our current infrastructure just to see if anything could be improved. Um, something we noticed or Lauren pointed out when we were doing it is we had our main.tf file, so our main Terraform in infrastructure file. Um, we actually could use, we actually created our Elastic Container repo manually. So we would probably add that into the Terraform file to be created along with adding the policies to just sort of add to the automation. Um, and something else we noticed quite early on is all server traffic is, is HTTP. So we would probably next steps enable HTTPS um, just to add to the security of the site. Um, obviously, in the second week of the project as well, we had some events that led to increased site traffic, like Jack said. Um, we, going forward, we would probably uh, implement Kubernetes and use their replicas and pods features to increase the number of replicas to sort of scale the application up to handle additional traffic. Um, and so when all of that is done, we would continue with the additional client requests. So um, storing image screening results and tightening up the system authentication for people who are using it. Uh, yeah, so we've just put our, so this was our reliability panel that we had, um, and yesterday we achieved 100% reliability. Um, we were close on, the, on Wednesday, but we actually tried to implement some improvements. Uh, and whilst it was down for, um, it was probably only not, not online for about 15 minutes, less than that, it was probably, probably in about 10 minutes. Uh, we did have some failures creep through there, um, but we managed to maintain it on Friday, uh, sorry, Thursday for 100% there. Uh, and another highlight of ours was just our general kind of team um, mentality and team ethos. And we put all the, well, our Myra board was a, a constant source of entertainment when we were feeling a bit frustrated and we didn't really uh yeah we, we had a lot of frustrations but um yeah so we, this is where we just we, we had all of our emotional check-ins um our retros and where we had all of our notes all of our diagrams all of our memes <laughs> uh yeah this one this one really hit home for me i think this was one i made uh because i accidentally looked at the wrong pipeline and I saw it pass, and I'm not even going to lie. I, I think I shed a little tear of joy. Um, and then I realized I was looking at the wrong thing. And then I shed a tear of pain and sadness. But, you know, we have these ups and downs. Uh, 
but yeah, we, we managed to get it working and uh, we're really, really proud of, of what, what we achieved across the last two weeks. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Team two stars. Uh, I think you definitely should be proud. There's a lot of hard work you've done in there and a lot of learning, uh, definitely for you and for everyone that took part in this project. Um, amazing presentation and especially love the work we would do next if we had more time. Uh, some great ideas in there about scaling the application using Kubernetes uh, and yeah, looking into like modularizing your, your, the, the way that you manage your infrastructure creation through the platform as well. Some great ideas in there. Love it, love to see that. Um, so with the second team for this afternoon, uh, so it's team fantastic for uh, for the second group today, you'll get to hear from their experiences as well. Uh, but I can tell you, right, they work really well together as a team of four. Um, so it's their turn to present now. So please, Tim, on to your presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Rosie, and I'm part of the Fantastic Four team, joined with Wesley, Anissa, and Chris. And Wesley's going to kick us off with speaking about our project on reliability. Uh, so we were given an existing hospital system of, over which we only had limited control and we had to increase our reliability of this system without interrupting its day-to-day -day use. Uh, but you can see our reliability track at the beginning of the project averaged um, about a 3% error rate. Next slide, please. Um, our understanding of the current system uh, shown in this diagram was that the traffic was generated from the front end, passed through a load balancer before reaching the web server. We and we only had access and control over the load balancer, so we focused our so we focused our attention on inc on increasing the visibility of what traffic was coming into the system. Uh, next slide, please. So here, here's a timeline of our projects, um, as well as the keystone points that occurred. So on Monday, we researched the existing system and realized that we needed more visibility so that we could further research the cause of these reliability errors. Uh, next, we implemented several systems to improve this visibility um, of what traffic was passing through the load balancer, um, as, well as, the, as well as the errors that we were receiving. Um, after that, we built our proxy, which passed traffic from the load balancer to the proxy and then onto the web server um, and re-attempted uh, traffic requests that returned errors before they were returned to the load balancer. Um, once we felt that we had a working system, we tested the proxy on all incoming GET traffic. And once we had 100% success rate with the GET traffic, we then implemented this on post traffic as well, as well as tweaking the proxy where necessary. Um, and finally, once all the traffic was going to the web server reliably, we looked into uh, resolving any remaining erroneous errors, and we noticed that unauthorized, attempt, unauthorized attempts were being made to access our data, so we implemented a firewall. Uh, next slide, please. So we um, increased our observ observability by using the following uh, techniques. So we used login, which allowed us to see details of each request made to the server. We monitored the load balancer, which allowed for more detailed metrics, such as processor usage, and we used app in, and we used app insight, which was automatically, which which was able to automatically fix some errors that were affecting our system. Using all these allowed us to see see that the majority of errors were uh, had 500 and 503 status codes, which which we knew from the um, documentation were internal server errors. Uh, this meant that we would have to implement a system that would allow us to retry to retry these requests so that they will be processed by the server rather than returning an error. And um, Roisin is going to talk us through um, how we increase our reliability. OK, so our plan. Um, we knew that these were try again later errors that we were receiving. So we uh, decided to develop a proxy app which would reattempt any requests that received these responses and in that hope we would get successful um, responses back. So to do this, we decided to build a Flask app. Um, the Flask is a web framework for the Python language that we've been using previously in the course. We're all quite familiar with it. Um, so we decided to build this code on GitLab. Um, this meant we all had access to the code, we could edit it, and we could use a CI CD pipeline to automate deploying it to AWS. Um, we deployed it initially to S3, which is where the co code was stored in a bucket. And then we used another service called Code Deploy uh, to deploy our proxy app to an EC2 instance, which is where it was run. 
Uh, we also installed on the EC2 instance PM2, uh, which just automated running the server, meaning that we had less, we had more reliability that the proxy server would be running at all times, and that wouldn't um, affect our availability of the system. Now, in doing this, there were many challenges along the way. Obviously, the first one is we were building a new type of app. Um, I speak for everyone. I say we, none of us had created a proxy app before. Um, so to combat this, we um, decided together what we thought the app would require. And we broke that down into some pseudocode um, and listed the actions that would be necessary in the code. And then we did a lot of research uh, working out how exactly we could use Python and Flask to um, create this app. We also had the challenge of having a limited availability of the system. Uh, we only had access to the load balancer, which meant we could only see uh, the metrics that were on, available on there. Um, this meant that we had to intuit how the system worked using the API documentation, which gave us quite a limited understanding. So to um, improve this, we uh, obviously we improved visibility on the load balancer by getting logging and um, seeing the metrics. But we also used our proxy. Uh, when it was live, we could print the traffic that was coming in and the traffic that we, we were receiving back from the server and we could print exactly what we were receiving in there. So we had full visibility on what data was being sent across and we could see where any flaws were in uh, the responses. Um, another of the challenges was testing. Now we had a live system, we didn't have a test system to test with. So we were basically very aware that any testing we did on the live system would greatly affect the availability of the system and obviously the reliability. So we made sure that most of our testing was done outside the live system. We used our proxy um, with an endpoint of different websites so that we could check that the proxy was working fully before we made it live. And then when we did make it live, we limited uh, the control of traffic. So we only put a small percentage of requests through. Um, and in doing so, it just meant that any uh, flaws in the proxy code that we couldn't foresee did not affect too greatly the availability of the system. Um, and finally, we had the security challenge. Once our proxy was successful, we did notice suspicious attempts to access data on the server. Um, so we installed WAF, which is an AWS web application firewall, which counters common attacks and blocks the IPs making these attempts. So we thought that was a solid um, bit of security in place um, to counteract this traffic coming in. Um, and the final outcome of the challenge for us, we got 99.9%, .9%, which da, 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 was exactly what we were hoping for it at the beginning of the challenge. Um, and as a result, we got this lovely flashing star, which was very exciting and worth all the effort. Um, but we definitely wouldn't have been able to get to this point without the work of our team and um, success that we had together as a group was reliant on a lot of factors. So I will let Anissa uh, explain to you how we got to this point as a group. Thanks for that, Roisin. So yes, our team's success was not because of the amount of knowledge that we had, but it was due to how we worked together as a team to facilitate learning. Um, so we'd had our daily stand-ups, which allowed us to set goals for the day and give us uh, some direction. And this was led by the facilitator of the day. And then we had the end of day retros, which allowed us to bring to light anything that didn't go so well, what we want to implement the next day and to celebrate the successes that we had, which really helped to keep us motivated throughout the project. Um, the Miro board um, was a central place for where everyone could document their ideas, where we did our retros, our check-ins, um, it was a bit like having a massive whiteboard and everyone had a pen, which allowed us to collaborate well. We discussed ideas openly, um, we encouraged active listening with keeping the objective in mind. And um, we also made a point to note that criticising an idea didn't mean that we were criticising the person. Um, we had to be strategic when allocating time to mobbing and working solo throughout the project um, so that we could be as productive as possible. Um, and whilst mobbing, we felt it was important to rotate drivers often. Now, driving is something that for a lot of us, it, it does take us out of our comfort zone, but that really lent itself to, you know, the whole learning experience. And finally, we adopted the Pomodoro technique, the Zoom edition, which helped us to avoid the burnout um, and structure the day. Next slide, please, Rogine. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> so teamwork wasn't only about implementing processes. It was about having that emotional intelligence. Um, so we had emotional check-ins throughout the day and that was a really important part of working together. And um, you can see the blob tree on the screen there that um, it added a different dimension to the check-ins and it really helped us to express how we were feeling. Uh, in our team, I know that we were the flag bearers of there are no stupid questions, which encouraged, uh, encouraged the um, open discussions that we had without uh, the judgment being there. We created uh, inclusive, an inclusive safe space so that we could ask questions and so that no developer was left behind. And of course, you have to inject some fun into the work that you're doing. And yeah, I never realised you could laugh so much on a reliability project, but yeah, it was good fun. So Chris is now going to give you an overview of our Makers course overall. Uh, we've had a great time on this course. Um, as you can see, it's been a pathway and it seems so far away the mountain, but we've reached it now. We've got to the top of the mountain and, and over the top we're, look, we're peaking and we can see a new set of mountains arriving. And, and we've, we've really enjoyed this. Initially, we were on a 10 week software engineering course and we learned our first stacks of technology culminating in us working on engineering projects. So we did a, B, a Makers B&B project with Ruby and Sinatra. We did an Ace Book project with Python and Flask and we demoed them back to our cohorts. And it was in September that we started focusing on our DevOps principles, the people, processes and automation. And through a variety of challenges, we've been exposed to lots of tools and, and highlights for me really being around this sort of the continuous integration and deployment pipelines. You know, seeing that automation running of testing and deployments was amazing. And our exposure to our Amazon cloud services, it's come second nature to us now during the weeks. And um, the fact that you can, a script can actually create a server now um, through infrastructure as code using Terraform and Ansible um, just seemed amazing to us when we saw it the first time uh, and now just seems commonplace. Um, and now I'm creating robust applications through containerization using Docker and Kubernetes and applying security principles um, has taken us to, to today, really. For us, our Eureka moments. Um, I think it's the automate the ability to exploit the tools that we've been ex we, we've been given access and training on now is absolutely amazing. I'm just we're just itching to have a go to get to the challenge of knitting these together and producing some real results from them. Um, one of the other things as well that we've learned is test driven development. It takes longer in the first instance, but actually it saves you time in the long run and you produce consistent products. Um, key one really is. Some of these challenges, especially the site reliability one, it seemed impossible when we started. We, we were like, how on earth are we going to do this? You know, but through teamwork and through supporting each other, we really made it happen. Um, and by setting daily goals and actively seeking feedback and, and, and using just changing the way you say things can have a, such a powerful impact. So instead of saying I can't do something is I, I can't do it yet. And it just helps you get along the way of the journey of overcoming the obstacles. So we as a team really just wanted to say a thank you to the coaches who were amazing throughout this, uh, Katerina, Eddie, Dana and Simo. But, but last not least, Hostway has been an absolute star for us. So we just wanted to say thank you um, and just hand back. Thank you for that, Tim. It's been such a pleasure to work with all of you over the last eight weeks as well. And seeing how much progress you've made has been is totally amazing. Uh, maybe you don't realize right now that you made such a great amount of progress, to be honest. And I've been witnessing all of that since day one. So it should be a really, be really proud. I uh, love that slide about Eureka moment. Uh, it's so representative of your journey throughout the whole uh, 18 weeks and makers that you've been through. Um, so yeah, really clear and really good presentation as well. Congratulations team for all your hard work. Um, now we're going to go to the last theme for today. Uh, Steam Know How, uh, finally the also a team of five members as well uh, that has worked really well together uh, to get to a nice outcome in the reliability project as well. Um, you're going to get to hear more from them uh, in a minute. So please Steam on to your presentation as well. Hi everyone, sorry it's one second, I'll just get our presentation up. Hey, yeah, so everyone, hi everyone, yeah, we are Team NoHop, my name is Ben and welcome to our presentation um, today. 
on our reliability project. The project is a final project of our 18 week course with makers and today we'll be discussing who our project was for and our tasks and challenges that were set, um, how, our, how we worked as a group, our finished project and what we chose to use, what would we do, we'd do differently next time, what we've learned during the course and we'll mention some of our personal highlights of the course and there'll also be an opportunity to ask any questions at the end. So who was it for? Um, we were hired by a client who wanted us to replace a critical system that they used to store patient notes and medical images so that the staff and uh, so that all staff can access them at all times. They had various veterinary hospitals that all needed access to one shared server. So our tasks and challenges. We were asked to, improve, to make improvements to the critical system whilst also keeping it available uh, um, for as much as possible. And some of the improvements included improving the reliability of the system, which we actually didn't have access to. The goal was for the server to respond to 99% of user requests successfully. As you can see on the screen, it initially was responding to about 97%. Um, and yeah, and this 99% this is a slightly relaxed version of the five nines, um, which is normally 99.99% of requests within three seconds, and also availability of 99.999% of the time. Um, and this uh, it also should have had no security breaches. And we were also tasked at preserving the actual functionality of the system. Some of the challenges that we had to contend with were that we actually had no access to the code on the server and that we could only access the load balancer, which is a device that distributes the traffic across the servers. Um, we needed to make sure that we kept this server as available for as much as possible and also respond to various um, challenges throughout the week, such as the traffic increases in um, when, when the cross took place. I will now pass over to Michael, who will discuss how we worked as a group. Thanks, Ben. Um, so going into this project, we knew we'd be uh, working as a team for the for two weeks and uh, the final project was riding on it. So we uh, developed a way of working together and we all agreed on it early on the first day, uh, something that kind of suited us. We built upon methods we'd learned in previous weeks of the DevOps course and the Makers course as a whole. So integrating techniques like the Pomodoro technique, which is a, a timekeeping technique, so that we made sure we were taking regular breaks, not burning out, and um, working in DevOps concepts like embracing a blameless culture, uh, daily stand-ups and retros, which I think was really good for all of us. Um, we checked in regularly with each other and we tried to keep communication as open and honest between each other, as well as kind of between the other groups. That was really important for us. And uh, as well uh, with, the, with the tutors as well. Um, being aware that we were kind of mobbing together on calls most days, um, we were really careful to kind of switch around different roles, um, rotating between who was driving and who was navigating, uh, making sure everybody was collaborating had something to do and nobody did more work than anyone else um, to kind of encourage this we also organized a new facilitator each day just somebody to kind of oversee um, the whole group and what they were doing uh, i'm going to pass to tyler who's going to talk about what we actually did in the project thank you michael so uh, our finished project uh, we used a proxy server, a reverse proxy server actually, that intercepts the traffic. Uh, it resends all the failed requests to improve reliability. As previously, it was all just going through the host web server. And if a request failed, it just submitted it as failed and it reduced the success rate. Uh, a lot of the requests were just basic API calls, trying to get information from a database, database and we had no uh, authorization to edit any of that code. So that's why we implemented the proxy server. Uh, we all made the deployment using easy to code deploy and S3. So to summarize it, the text stack up is that we used a we used Python, which implemented a Flask web app framework. We, this is what was built upon for the proxy reverse server. 
Uh, to implement that, we uploaded it to GitLab and integrated a CI CD pipeline. Uh, this allowed us just to have continuous integration so that we could push it along to code deploy and an S3 bucket. And once we were able to do that, we were able to continuously deploy any changes that we were able to make to it. And using all those, we were able to uh, get successful, uh, well, 100% success rate. I'm just going to pass it over to Hamid now, who's going to explain what we might have done differently and uh, what we would do next time. Thank you. Um, so there are a few things that we would do differently next time. Um, the first thing I would say is we would have a longer planning stage. And during this planning stage, we could do some research into what technologies could be used to solve the issues and uh, weigh up the pros and cons of them. We did know that Nginx was an option, but we decided to use Flask instead, um, because mainly because it gave us an opportunity to gain more exposure to Python. Another thing that we could do is refactor the code. When you refactor code, you improve the readability and it, it makes it easier to make changes to that code in future. Uh, we could have used PM2, which is a logging tool. Uh, during our project, we just used the Flask logs and um, that, that meant we had to manually run the Python script. Uh, also, Terraform would be another option that we could use to automate the, uh, the provisioning of the infrastructure. And um, we did, while we did stick to the Pomodoro technique most of the time, there were times where we would finish a Zoom call and then jump straight back into a Zoom call because we were really keen on solving a problem. And I think if we were to do the project again, um, it would, we would try and be more strict with the Pomodoro technique. If we had more time, I think we could gain a deeper understanding of the technologies that we used, and also we could have worked on the improvement tickets. Um, I'll pass you over to Becky now. Thanks, Hamid. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about what we've learned both throughout this final project and throughout the DevOps course as a whole. So first off, we learned loads of different tools and technologies such as AWS tools, the GitLab CI CD tools, Terraform, Docker, Postman, and many other tools. These have all been really interesting to learn um, and kind of get an overview of. Um, we're really looking forward to spending more time looking at some of those in the future. Other things we learned about were principles of CI CD, so kind of understanding why we do continuous integration, not just doing it because we know that we have to as DevOps people, but understanding the theory behind it and why it's really useful. Uh, that links into automation, um, making sure we can automate as much as we can. And we really bear that in mind during our final project. We also learned lots about pair programming and mobbing and how to do those effectively and like when they're useful to do and when they're not as useful to do. We worked really effectively as a team using a lot of the techniques that Michael talked spoke about earlier um, and we think that we learned a lot about teamwork during the project. We also learned about diagramming so we learned some different tools to use different ways we could do that but I think most of all we learned how useful it is um, it's not something that I'd ever really thought about doing at the start of the project or the start of the course and was a bit hesitant to do sometimes um, but we learned about how useful it can actually be. Some of our kind of key takeaways from the whole course are try to understand all the codes that you're using. It can be really tempting when you're stuck on something to just look on Stack Overflow, find something that looks similar to what you're doing and copy and paste it into your project. But in the long run, that's never going to have good effects because you don't understand what you're implementing and you're not going to be able to find any issues with it. It can also be tempting sometimes to try and refactor code to make it look better. So it's a really short solution, but in the long run, that's not going to help you in the future if you don't fully understand what it all does. We learned that looking at something with fresh eyes can be one of the most effective things to find problems. So whether that's getting someone else in the team to look at it or whether it's coming going away for a couple of hours and looking at it again. We learned that there's many different solutions to one problem. This is especially the case when we're one team and we know there's two other teams working on the same project, but doing it in different ways. Um, not comparing yourself to them because there's not always one right solution. There's many different ways to do it and that's okay. As long as you kind of look at the different options you have and pick what works best for you, that's the best thing to do. Uh, we learned that teamwork really does make the dream work. Um, when you're learning new things, it can be tempting to just kind of try to go off on your own and do things, but 
throughout the course, we've learned that working together really is the best way to improve and learn about software. Um, and finally, planning and diagramming will make your life so much easier. It can be tempting to just jump into something when you're on an exciting new project, but taking a step back and trying to plan it first um, is always a really useful solution. Finally, we're going to talk through some of our highlights from the course. So my personal highlight was just being able to work effectively in different teams every week and create a whole bunch of projects that we're really proud of and we can look back on. One of my highlights was just using all that we've learned to make final projects to be proud of, just knowing all the technologies that we were using for the past eight weeks and being able to make context of them and using them all together was really good. For me, it was about um, gaining exposure to a huge variety of technologies. Uh, I think for me, nothing will beat that feeling of seeing that 100% success rate uh, the night before the presentation. And finally for me, it was getting to learn something new every week and putting what we've learned into action. Thank you much for your time today, everyone. And are there any questions? Thank you so much, Sam. Really good presentation. Uh, really love that teamwork makes dream work. Love that sentence. Um, yeah, all of the lessons that you've extracted from this project to improve moving forward. Uh, love all of that. So congratulations to all of the teams. You've done a great job. You learned so much. Uh, yeah, now that's the time for Q&A. So we're curious to see if there's any questions from the audience to any of the teams, to the uh, to any uh, to all of the students in general, any questions that you're wondering about right now, it would be a great opportunity uh, and the best time for you to ask them. I don't have a question, but I have just something to say. It, the level at which you guys are working at is very impressive. Are coming in as apprentices, you guys will do very well. No doubt. Thank you for your comment. I'm sure they would be glad to hear that. Probably learn more of you guys <laughs> than vice versa. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to echo that from the perspective. I thought they were really good presentations. I thought all three of them brought a, a slightly different view, but really, really good and really well presented. So well done, everybody. Hi, everybody. It's um, Amy from DWP. Yeah, just to say, um, just to echo what's been said, I think it's absolutely amazing what you've achieved over 18 weeks. Um, it sounds like it's been really challenging, but really rewarding, and you've done um, absolutely amazing. So thank you for sharing um, your presentations with us. Really, really high standard. And um, I've just got a question. How are you feeling at the end of it? you exhausted, energised, feeling good? <laughs> need a weekend to recover before you start your roles. Just be good to hear how you're all feeling. Yeah, really good, I would say. Um, it's been like a really hard, especially the last couple of weeks, but I think this end feeling, especially having this presentation, seeing what everyone's done, it's like really uplifting. And I think we all just feel like really proud of the work that we've done. Yeah, I can't quite believe it's uh, ending. It feels like quite a quite a journey we've been on. Um, yeah, we're definitely in the high with this project, I'd say. Um, really feel enthusiastic because of the success of it. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, and just something else to add, I think was it was brilliant that we've all actually had like quite a large group all going to the same role together. I think that's been really helpful. So like we're all going to be able to have people who we know who maybe might experience different things now in the next few months who will be able to sort of bounce ideas off and not just be sort of like two or three people who you've met just this one time like yeah good good relationships with everyone fantastic
Yeah, it's going to be weird not seeing everyone from the other offices. Next week, <laughs> it's just the Manchester, isn't it, for us? Well, for Manchester, yeah. <laughs> going to yeah, miss some morning think... conversations with uh, Jess and uh, Lauren and Jack and everyone, and Daniel. <laughs> it's been nice. <laughs> I mean, we are still alive. You can still talk to us. <laughs> still here in the internet. Yeah, yeah, we're still here. Um, yeah, I just want to add one more thing. So I, I was a little bit panicky, like, over the past six weeks. Because I always thought, well, we've achieved this particular, like, task for that week. But then I always thought to myself, if I was asked to do something slightly different, I wouldn't be able to achieve it. Mm. Um but then these past two weeks, uh, I was actually really shocked and surprised at how how much like we remembered, how much we've learned, and how well we were all able to kind of crack on with this after you know the initial panic of what the blooming heck we're we doing. Uh, but yeah, that was something I've been really, really like extremely proud of, and I think we've all done so well. Uh, and I'm just excited to to get to work now <laughs> which I never thought I'd say but you know find the right job brilliant it's really good can I just tell you Shirley from uh, so I head up the practice support team for uh, the engineering practice that you'll all become part of when you start with us next week um, Stuart Taylor is our head of practice and uh, he's unfortunately had to uh, to dip off to do school run, but he wanted to pass on his congratulations to you all. Really uh, great demos. Thank you very much. Um, but he his question that he wanted me to ask, if if I may, is uh, did you have any failures? And if you had failures, what did you learn from them? Um, I think. I think everyone here, if I don't mind speaking for everyone on our side, it was everyone probably had failures. <laughs> and I can, guarantee you that, I can guarantee you that most of them come down to not planning it out first properly. Just jumping in thinking, ah, I can tackle this first time. And then uh, find out very quickly that it's a little more complex than that usually. <laughs> we definitely kept coming across a new hurdle. Every time we thought we'd cracked it, something unforeseen would come back and we'd be like, oh, back to the drawing board. But it always kind of felt like throughout the project when we were having these issues, it always felt like we're one step closer, we'll just resolve this and then the next thing will be smooth sailing. Yeah, and I, uh, I think after after switching to kind of like the DevOps side of things over the last few weeks, uh, I've forgotten how to debug. Um, so I had to kind of get my, my actual software engineer head on this week when we were writing the proxy code um but yeah having that that debugging process and just being a bit patient and reading the error messages because they're i mean they essentially tell you the answer bit by bit <laughs> hey, i have a little question about your pair programming and mob programming seeing there's such a big group of you how did you divvy up some of the tasks and pair program or mob program how did you manage that doing it online? Because pre-COVID, when we would pair program in the office, it was a doddle. Two people on a keyboard, screens in front of you, no problem. But doing over Zoom, it's a whole different vibe. So how did you guys kind of tackle that? I think because it's all that we've actually done in terms of pair programming, I think you've kind of, it's just naturally now what we're used to. I think it'd be quite unusual pair programming with someone next to you. I think it's things just like making sure, like I quite often will be the case where I'll move my mouse when someone else is presenting and I'll have to, oh no, sorry, I mean like this line of code and then this bit. And then there's quite a bit of, uh, like quite, quite often I'll type some code and paste it into the chat rather than sort of telling someone like what to write. I'll just say, oh, this should go into this line. I think it's just, we've probably just, because we've had 18 weeks have only been able to sort of pair program or mob program but via zoom that we've just sort of become accustomed to it i uh, ah. oh sorry oh go ahead go ahead i was gonna say I, I think it works quite well online as well because whilst one person's sharing their screen and 
showing what they're doing in the code and doing the driving. The other person can have Google up on another window and they can be Googling a problem and advising as they go. It's quite nice to discuss it over Zoom. I think it works quite well having two computers doing one job. Mm, one person on Netflix, the other person do. <laughs> That's just Michael. I am joking, he's great to work with. <laughs> see you Monday. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs> Good luck, Michael. <laughs>